In this fairly familiar Old Testament story, we find the priest and prophet Ezekiel. Now, Ezekiel had been exiled. In other words, he had been kicked out of his homeland along, along with thousands of other Jews in 597 BCE. And this happened when the Neo-Babylonian Empire, led by King Nebuchadnezzar II, attacked Jerusalem. They somehow managed to capture the king of Judah, Jehoiakim, and then he and thousands and thousands of Israelites were exiled, including Ezekiel. And we read about this in the book of 2 Kings chapter 24. It's thought that Ezekiel was about 25 years old at the time of his exile. So after he was exiled, God came to Ezekiel and called him to begin to prophesy to the people around him, saying that if you do not repent of your sins, in other words, your unfaithfulness to God, bad things are going to happen back in your homeland, specifically in Jerusalem. And indeed, 10 years later, in 587 BCE, Jerusalem was attacked once again by the Neo-Babylonian Empire. This time, they managed to capture the city, dissolve the entire kingdom of Judah, and destroy the temple. This was Solomon's temple, the first temple. And this is written about in 2 Kings chapter 25. After this second attack and the destruction of the city and the temple, even more Israelites were exiled. They were sent out into the Jewish diaspora at Nebuchadnezzar II's hands. And it's good to remember that this is the same king who threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fiery furnace from which they emerged untouched. More than any other biblical prophet, Ezekiel, who's also considered a prophet in the Islamic faith, seemed to make grand gestures to prove his points. He experienced strange visions. He fell into trances. One time he ate a scroll, which would have been made out of papyrus or animal skin, on which prophetic words had been written. Another time he was commanded by God to lie on his left side for 390 days, and then he was to roll over and lie on his right side for 40 days, all the while bound by rope so he could not get up, all to demonstrate the sins of the people towards God. So by the time today's story occurred, he had been a prophet for quite a while, and perhaps Today, when we're seeing this story, he had felt like a man who had failed his mission because there he had been preaching to the people, the rebellious people, time and time again, saying, if you do not change your ways, there will be consequences. And then one day, disaster indeed struck and their beloved Jerusalem was destroyed. Ezekiel's prophecies had been fulfilled. Surely, he was a man who understood suffering. We know that in his own lifetime, he had been stripped of all of his possessions, deported from the only home he'd ever known. At some point, he had married and his wife had died. And now his beloved city, Jerusalem, was captured and destroyed, and the temple around which the Jews' lives revolved was destroyed. I'm sure there were some serious wounds that were caused by all of these heartbreaking events because their very identity as God's children had been stripped away from them, their traditions, their place of worship, everything. It's in the midst of all of this that Ezekiel is called by God to continue to be a prophet and I seriously hope that Ezekiel renegotiated his pastor's compensation package at this point and asked for at least some more vacation time before he said yes to God again. Except this time God called him not to preach words of punishment, but rather words of hope and compassion and comfort. 
God called him to be a prophet to the beaten down Israelites. He's supposed to care for them and encourage them and nurture them, not condemn them. So today we see Ezekiel, who was led by God in what was probably a vision, to a field of destruction, utter destruction, not unlike the ruins of Jerusalem. There before him lay the bones and the remnants of God's people. The scene of carnage could easily have been interpreted as a reflection of the destruction their nation had just experienced. And it might have made Ezekiel reflect. If only the stubborn and rebellious people had listened, maybe none of this would have happened. Surely this is where the story ends, Ezekiel must have thought. But God takes him into that wasteland of death. And then God asks him, oh mortal, is there any possibility of bringing life back into so much death? And Ezekiel basically says, I don't know, God, only you know. And God tells Ezekiel to begin to prophesy. And as he does this, something miraculous begins to happen. The bones begin to rustle and rattle in the dirt where they lay. And then suddenly, they reattach themselves to one another. And then there are tissue and ligaments that begin to connect things together. And then there's muscle, and then there's flesh, and then there's skin, and Ezekiel continues to prophesy until suddenly breath came back into the bones. And suddenly there they are standing before Ezekiel, living, breathing, alive. Ezekiel preached to the people words of hope that one day God would restore their exiled nation, that they would be gathered together once again, returned to their homeland, and the temple rebuilt. Ezekiel said, God's going to give you a new spirit and a new heart, and explained that this would be an act of grace on God's, on God's part. And in the end, these prophecies also were fulfilled. The Persian Empire defeated the Neo-Babylonian Empire who had destroyed Jerusalem, and the Persian Empire's leader was named Cyrus the Great, and he sent out a proclamation encouraging all of these people of faith who had been dispersed in exile to return to their holy land. And in 516 BCE, the temple in Jerusalem was rebuilt. It's called the second temple. This would have been the temple Jesus grew up in. And it too was destroyed roughly 40 years after Jesus died when Jerusalem was attacked yet again. Just a, a really difficult history for those people of faith. Have you ever had something happen to you in your life so overwhelming that you were sure it was the end? There was no hope. Maybe it was the end of a relationship or a career, either by your own choice or someone else's. Maybe it was financial struggles or an addiction that you can't seem to conquer. Maybe it was chronic pain or mental illness or disease, something that felt like the end, something that looked very much like the ruins of your life laying before you. Or maybe you've made some bad choices. You feel ashamed, it's your secret. It covers you like a shroud and the shame hurts your heart over and over and over and you are sure you are certain that there is nothing that can be done to make it right. Maybe you've experienced some of these things in your past, or maybe you are experiencing it right now. The good news in this story today is this. God is not done with us yet. It is never too late for God to bring us back to life. Our lives might look like the dry, brittle, decomposing bones laying before Ezekiel in that field, but it is not over for God. And to prove this, 
These weren't just barely dead people laying in the dirt. These were long beyond the realm of even God's help people. There's no limit to God's grace and God's ability to take us from the very worst place to a place of hope and life is not held back by our inability to imagine it. In the original Hebrew text of this story that we read, there's one word that occurs nine times. It's the Hebrew word ruach, and it's translated as breath or wind or God's spirit. Whether we see it as breath or wind or spirit, it's all from God and it is a symbol of God's presence with us. We saw that spirit breath pour down upon Jesus when he was baptized, sending him out into the world. And in the same way God blew his breath, his Holy Spirit, onto those disciples on Pentecost, sending them out into the world as well. And that same renewal is given to us here today because God is present and gives us his breath, we too can live again. Today, All Saints Day, we remember the hope of the resurrection. We remember that God has breathed new life into the souls of our dear ones who have gone before us. We proclaim that even if we cannot understand it, and even if we doubt it, God has been and is faithful to his promises to us, his promise that he will always be with us, his promise of life, abundant and eternal, that we have received through our loving Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who was dead and then rose again in a confusing, mysterious manner, has made it possible for us to have life too. And so we know, we know that although our dear mothers and fathers, our dear sisters and brothers, our dear husbands and wives, our dear sons and daughters, our dear friends are no longer with us physically, the breath of God has blown upon them and they have been brought into the fullness of life, the richest life, the perfect life, the joy-filled life. And we trust that one day, we too will receive this ruach, this life-giving breath as well. The resurrection of the bones was God's power, but it worked through Ezekiel, the one who said with uncertainty, I don't know, when God asked him if the bones could be brought back to life. But Ezekiel knew that God knew whether it was possible. When does God's power need to work through us and our own uncertainty? When does God beckon to us to speak words of life when the situation before us looks hopeless and seems to be the end? When are we in a place of desolation, just like Ezekiel, heartsick and broken over the trauma and loss in our own lives, and God calls upon us to bring hope to our fellow sufferers? I think it happens a lot. And that's why it's important that we understand the idea that we are each a wounded healer. Dutch Catholic priest, professor, and theologian Henry Nouwen wrote about this idea of the wounded healer, and it's one to which I've always held fast. Being a wounded healer means that even when we are broken, even when we are hurting, God can and does use us to help those around us who are also hurting and broken. And as we help those around us find healing and wholeness, we discover that along the way, we too have found healing and wholeness. So we are not to try to hide our woundedness, 
out of shame or embarrassment. Rather, we are to determine how we can offer up our woundedness for the purpose of helping others. And in the process, we will find help as well. Like with Jesus, once we are healed, we may still bear the scars of our experiences, just as he bore the, the holes where the nails were and the wound in his side. Resurrection is not always pretty, and yet at its very core, it is beautiful. Episcopalian priest Barbara Brown Taylor tells about the time she spent three days on a barrier island where loggerhead turtles were laying their eggs. She wrote, one night while the tide was out, I watched a huge female turtle heave herself up on the beach to dig her nest and empty her eggs into it. Afraid of disturbing her, I left before she was finished. The next morning I returned to see if I could find the spot where her eggs were hidden in the sand. And what I found were her tracks leading in the wrong direction. Instead of heading back out to sea, she had wandered into the dunes, which were already as hot as asphalt in the morning sun. A little ways inland, I found her, exhausted, all but baked, her head and flippers caked with dried sand. After pouring water on her and covering her with seaweeds, I fetched a park ranger who returned with a jeep to rescue her. He flipped her on her back, wrapped tire chains around her front legs, hooked the chains to a trailer hitch on his Jeep, and then I watched horrified as he took off, yanking her body forward so that her mouth filled with sand and her neck bent so far back I was afraid it would break. The ranger hauled her over the dunes and down onto the beach. And at the ocean's edge, he unhooked her and turned her right side up. She lay motionless in the surf as the water lapped at her body, washing the sand from her eyes, making her skin shine once more. A wave broke over her. She lifted her head slightly, moving her back legs. Other waves brought her further back to life until one of them made her light enough to find a foothold and push off back into the ocean. Watching her swim slowly away and remembering her nightmare ride through the dunes, I reflected that it is sometimes hard to tell whether you are being killed or saved by the hands that turn your life upside down. The truth is, we all wander in the wrong direction sometimes. We all find ourselves lying in that hot sun, our bones baking, wondering if we have anything left. Sometimes our lives get flipped upside down and we're getting dragged along into a situation we did not see coming. But then the Spirit of God is breathed upon us. We get turned right side up once more, and we find ourselves finally moving towards hope. That's really what this story is all about, hope. It offers us a ridiculous hope, the hope that there can still be life after the bones have been picked clean. It's almost as ridiculous as the hope that someone who had been dead and buried for nearly four days, as Lazarus had been, could be brought back to life. And it's almost as ridiculous as the hope that you and I cling to and celebrate every day of our lives, our own resurrections, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. God certainly marvels in astounding us and showing us the smallness of our imaginations. And our faithful response should be not to close our minds to the possibilities because they're scary and uncertain, not to dig our heels in because we cannot explain things, but to open ourselves up to God more fully so God can take and mold us more completely into the people that we were made to be. 
And so to you who have given up hope, who have given up dreaming, who think your best years are behind you, to you who think the Lord God has forgotten all about your little life, to you who pray, Lord, help, or where are you, God, in the midst of this crazy mess, to you who have sand in your mouths and have been dragged through the bowels of hell, to you, God says, arise. Arise from the heap of discarded dreams. Arise from this hot baked sand. Arise from the ashes. Arise to discover that I am breathing life back into you. So may this text today enter into our lives, fill our hearts, and cast a new and defining vision for one, for each one of us of God's spirit at work, a vision of renewal, a vision of restoration, because God isn't done with us yet, friends. It's never too late. It's never too much for God. And so when the question is lifted up into the heavens, oh mortal, is there any possibility of bringing life back into so much death? Our response must always be, yes! God is good. God is good. God is good. So thanks be to God. Amen.